today what we're going to do is we're going to look at actually writing the login portion of it. I remember we just faked it by put, by hard coding a user ID and password in. Um, because our task at the time was to talk about session variables and, and how they worked. Um, but now we want to actually do that, right? Because it would be pretty, pretty bad practice to have a, a hard-coded password. So I forget if we set up that table or not. So let me check to see in the database if we have set up the, the user's table. I don't think we did. I don't think we did either, but... We set up a user ID, a first name and a last name, and an image. This probably isn't good enough for what we want to do. We want to have a username and we want to have a password. What about the username column? What should we do when we make the username column? We should make sure that it's unique, right? How do we make sure that a column is unique if it is not the primary key? Index. Make a unique index on it. All right. The other thing we would want to do is we want to make sure it's required because everyone has to have. Another way to put this in, in, in database terms using the, the terminology is this would be a candidate key. In other words, this could have been the primary key had we, had we chosen so. But for reasons that we said before, namely that the auto number is nice because it's a single field and it's numeric and it won't take up a lot of space. It's probably a good idea to have the auto number as the key. All right, so I'll go in and and do what? Well, I'll modify the layout of this table and I'll put in a username. Make it a short text. It is required, and it is indexed, and does not allow duplicates. Now, the database is going to give me grief when I try to save this, right? Why is the database going to give me grief when I try to save this? Because you're adding a field to records that already exist. Right, because I'm adding a required field to records that already exist. Um, as such, it's not going to have uh, a value. None of these people have user IDs yet. So, what I'm going to have to do is temporarily get rid of my constraints till I add it. Then I'll go back and I'll put the constraints back on it. I actually just thought of that this second. And I'll put in user password And we can make it a short text as well. All right, so now I can save it. Do I want to save the changes? Sure. And I'll go in here, pull it back up, and we'll fill in the usernames for these people. Password. Password for everyone else will be password. Password for me will be something else. One, two, three, four. You gotta make up and P A dollar sign dollar sign. That's true. <laughs> In fact, I'm gonna one up them. I'm gonna make a P four dollar sign dollar sign W. The number zero. zero. <laughs> we'll never forget. RD. <laughs> and NORADS will do password. And mine will do one, two, three, four. Okay. So now I can go back in and add those constraints. 
all right? Um, if I tried to do it before, it wouldn't let me because, again, obviously, if it's a brand new field, no one has any values for it. So I can't make a required field right off. So I kind of have to do this in two steps. Now, if you are, how do I want to say this? In a real life environment, if I was adding a, a required field, if I had, for example, thousands of rows, I wouldn't want to have to go in and type each one of thousand rows. So I could write an update statement and just leave off the where clause to initialize it to something. All right. So let me think of an example um, of a required field. Uh, this is a stupid example, but it's the best I can think of on a Thursday, which is actually my Friday. All right. Um, let's say I never stored a stored phone number before. All right. And I decide I wanted to store it. And not only did I want to store it, I wanted to require it. Well, I ain't gonna call. I ain't gonna call up everyone and ask them their phone number, largely because if I'm not storing their phone number, I don't know their phone number. <laughs> right. Uh, but regardless. So what I might do is something dumb like put in a dummy phone number, like 555-555-555. And that's kind of poor practice, but what else would you do in a case like this? And then when they log on, put a message that says you must enter your phone number and, and direct them to a page that, that would do it. So that would be kind of an example. Although I always hate putting in dummy values into a database. In other words, values that mean something else other than what they really seem to indicate. In that case, 555-555-555 is not really a phone number. It's an indication that they have not yet entered their phone number, which is a bad thing to do. All right? You see that a lot in, like, old-fashioned databases. You know, part, our, we have part numbers. Part number, um, you know, our part numbers are A100, B200, C300. But... The A at the beginning indicates the department that owns that part number or the department that engineered that part number. And the last three numbers indicate the warehouse that is typically started. Now, you don't do that, right? You don't take and, and, and secret, build in secret codes into your data fields, right? If you want a warehouse field, you create a warehouse field. But again, I digress. All right, so now we can go in and we can set those as required without any difficulty and a unique index. A password we're going to make required, but we're not going to make an index on it. All right, and now we should be okay. It's kind of warning us that hey, you know, we might got we might have some problems here, and depending on the data, you know, it, it might take a while. Well, we only have five users, so it ain't gonna take too long. All right, there we go. All right, so now we're ready to go. Now, I know we haven't gone over the code yet to actually do this. Right now, we are hard coding the user ID and password. Okay. want to do here instead of hard coding it. I want to query the database, obviously, and I want to look at the users table. What is my SQL statement going to look like for this? I think I heard someone say the first word for it. Select. I say, I hope we get this part right. If not, it's going to be a long day. I don't know if you want to do all, but whatever items you want to get. Okay, so what items do we want to get for the user? Probably store their first and last name in the session variable. Okay, so we might store their first and last name.
first and last name as a session variable to, to uh, so that we can say, you know, good morning, Mike Zellers, or, or have a day, Don Huffman, or something like that. All right? Any security levels you might have stored? Okay, I don't really have security levels in this case, but if I had a column that said, you know, admin, yes or no, I'd want to store that. What else do I probably want to store? No, no, you do I need to store the username and password? No. Not really, once they've logged on. But there is one more field I do need to, to store. <coughs> Think of when they vote. I'm going to need their user ID, right? Because when we vote, we're going to stuff their user ID in there, not their username, not their first name, not their last name, not anything else. So, so our SQL statement will probably look like select user ID, first name, last name from user, where, where what? Well, something equals the user ID or username. Username equals, where, where username equals, equals the one text box and password, password equals, equals the, other. the other text box. So, what is the result of that? What will the result for that SQL statement be? How many rows will that SQL statement return? Well, it will return three columns. How many rows will it return? One. Will it always return one? No. No. When won't it return one? When the username or password is incorrect. When the username or password is incorrect. Okay. So, here's our scenario. We're going to run a SQL statement that says select user ID, first name, last name, from user, where user name equals text box one and user password equals text box two. We're either going to get one row or zero rows. If we get one row, we have a winner. The person logs on and we want to store those three values in session variables. Okay? If we get zero rows, then it's invalid. Alright? Now, which one is invalid if we get zero rows? We don't know. It could be either of the two. It could be that they got the username wrong, or they could get the password wrong. Is that okay? Uh, how do I want to phrase this? Do we, do, we want to, do we want to tell the user, do we need to tell or want to tell the user, hey, you got your user ID wrong versus, hey, you got your password wrong? I don't know, exactly. I guess it depends on the context and all that. Uh, my suggestion would be probably for better security, no, don't tell them which one you got wrong. Just say the, the credentials are not valid, right? That way, if someone's guessing or, or hacking or whatever and trying to log in, you're not giving them some information. Of course, that's inconvenient then for a legitimate user who goes and, like me, did I make it... M Zellers, did I make it ML Zellers, did I make it Mike Zellers, did I make it whatever. It's inconvenient for that sort of situation. But again, uh, it, it's funny how, you know, <laughs> I, wonder if, I, I wonder if any students of mine are going to remember anything I've told them 30 years from now. Because I had a professor literally over 30 years ago say, any security measure is an, is an inconvenience on a legit user. And it's funny, it's like, I remember that to this day, and it was 30 plus years ago. And it's like, I don't even know if the guy's still alive or not. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, he was relatively young back then, so he could be still alive. But um, it's funny how that made an impact. It's like, yeah, he's right. You know? Yeah. You know? So I guess you have to decide in the application. In this particular case, we're going to start out with the assumption that no, we don't want to tell him. We just want to tell him, hey, you logged in correctly or nope, you're wrong. Okay, so I like to think through this because in writing a program, in writing any program, or even writing a program snippet or whatever you want to call this, there's always the two aspects of it. The one aspect of it is what is it that I want to do? All right, and then the second aspect becomes well, what's the code that's going to make that happen? It's my experience is that you don't want to be fighting those two battles at the same time. All right? You only want to fight your battle on one front. So you want to take some time figuring out what you need to do. 
And then you can spend the time figuring out how you're going to do it and what's the proper syntax. If you're doing both, that's a lot to keep sorted in your head. So we sort of have an idea. And if I was smart, I would have wrote this stuff up on the board, maybe even written a little flow chart or whatever. But I think it would be pretty easy to imagine what to say. So now we have a clear idea of what we want to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to now translate that into code. All right. Now this code doesn't have any visual aspect to it. In other words, we're going to query the database and our code's going to do the testing. All right. But <coughs> it's not like our SQL statements that we did before where we're tying the results to a visual control. All right. We're not going to like retrieve the username and password and display on the screen the username and password, right? No, not a good idea, you know. We're simply going to retrieve behind the scenes the proper fields from the database, do our comparisons, and then either log the person on or not. So, we're going to use the same objects that we used when we created the SQL data source through the, 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 the UI through the through the IDE, you know, by dragging stuff on and clicking properties and all that. The only difference is we're going to actually write the code for it. So a lot of the things that you see are going to be familiar, all right. And a lot of the things you're going to see, the objects that we have used previously sort of took care of without us really worrying about it or, or being aware of it. So really. What, we, what we're going to be seeing, for the most part, is really nothing new per se. It's just us writing the code for it instead of letting, um, instead of letting the, the, the controls do their thing. So the first thing we want, are going to do is we are going to create a SQL data source. Oh my god, I can't believe it. My example that I have here is in VB code. So we'll be doing real-time translation here. <laughs> SQL data source. So we, here we've created it. This is analogous to us going and dragging the thing on the page, right? Except we're doing it through our code. All right. Pretty nifty, huh? Now, when we created a data source through the IDE by just dragging it over, what are some of the things that we had to set for it? What are some of the parameters we had to set for our SQL data source? What connection string? Connection string? The query. And the query you want to run, right? And, well, we'll see from there. Well, that's definitely a good starting point. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set, start off by setting the query string. And the query string, believe it or not, consists of two parts. It consists of a connection string and it consists of a provider.
do we want to hard code this connection string? Do we? <coughs> How much fun does that sound like? No, it doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> we already have the connection string somewhere, right? We do. It's somewhere in there. We have it in the web config file. We do. So, what we have to do is, is again, I'm looking at, my, my example is a little old, and I don't remember off the top of my head, but, pool values from web config. Ah, system dot configuration. So I will go in here and say system dot configuration. Connection strings. What's the name of my connection string? Connection string. Still griping to me. Up is a single name. Let's quickly go and say C sharp provider name from. Forgot to put the using up here for that. So, using system <coughs> dot configuration.
make sense. Yeah, I did. I did that on purpose. I shouldn't need the using directive if I fully qualify it. struggling with your programs. Why is configuration manager blue? What does that mean? Um, it was blue, I am not sure where it was in the IntelliSense. I have not completed with this statement, so I mean it, it's not going to be um, finished yet. So it could have been showing that there's an error when actually there wasn't an error. Well, I'm referring to the configuration manager text there. It's blue. I don't know. Because it's pretty. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess it's a class name. But some of these other things are class names too, aren't they? Well, no, I guess, I guess all the class names... I guess all the class names are blue. Now this one's a dark blue and that one's a light blue. Got me. At any rate, here is the correct statement. System, configuration, configuration manager, connection strings, dot, provider name. I'm going to do the same thing for connection string. Hopefully this one goes a little smoother. So what this is doing is this is pulling these two values, the connection string and the provider name, from the web config file, which is what happens automatically when you say that you want to use that connection string in the GUI. All right, so we've hooked this up to the database. Now the other thing that we have to provide to this, remember, is a query. All right. And we said the query would be something like this. It's Huffman. He's tired of me picking on him. So we walk by and kick the door. So let's go and actually look at the table name. Select user ID, first name, last name. From user. Name equals what? 